This is uh, the first international uh, scientific seminar on sustainable decommissioning. Uh, we have uh, people here in pres in, uh, present here to, uh, as an audience, and we also have uh, around 200 people uh, following our presentations here today uh, from YouTube. So uh, I thank everybody uh, for participating, for interest in the decommissioning topic, and uh, we welcome all uh, this event. Uh, this event is a is a no uh, desire that we have here uh, at uh, in in our research group uh, that we now have the opportunity to put in practice. Uh, this is the first uh, international scientific seminar uh, related to decommissioning topics. Uh, we want to to keep doing this, so I ask you to uh, follow our research group in the internet and uh, keep track of future uh, events like this one uh, that we want to put in practice. Uh, <clears throat> research related to decommissioning has gained importance here at UFRJ. Uh, an example is the res recent creation of the CONIDES, uh, a decommissioning hub implemented at COP UFRJ to join efforts on this fu uh, fundamentally interdisciplinary topic. Uh, in these seminars, we will seek to bring experiences from different parts of the globe in, in order to facilitate cooperation between research groups, bring applied research topics that can be implemented in Brazil, and also transferring knowledge to, the, to our society. Uh, this first topic uh, focuses on the research related to the interaction between man-made structures, notably for oil exploration in the marine environment, uh, and the, cha the challenges for an adequate understanding of this interaction in the Brazilian coast will also be uh, explored. We have uh, today uh, four presenters. Um, our key speakers is Professor Murray Roth, a uh, member of the Site Advisory Group, professor at the School of Geoscience uh, from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. Uh, we also have uh, two speakers that will be online. We also have uh, two speakers that will uh, join us uh, from uh, Zoom. Uh, that is Professor Sean Van Elden, from, professor at the School of Biological Science from the University of Western Australia, and uh, Dr. Joseph Nicolet, uh, that is Vice President of the Ecosystem Service Economic of Monte Rose Environmental uh, in the US. And uh, our last presenter will be Professor Paulo Salomão, that is uh, head of the Depart of Department of Marine Biology in the Biology Institute of uh, UFRJ. He is associate researcher uh, at uh, SAGE, a laboratory from, from COPY here. Uh, he will be present here with us. Okay. So, uh, welcome uh, uh, Sean and, uh, and uh, Joseph uh, to our uh, presentation here today. Uh, so I will start uh, calling our, our speakers. Uh, we will start with the presentations. I will introduce the speakers before each presentation. And at the end, we will have a debate section where the in-person and online audience can ask questions. So our first presenter is Professor, uh, is, uh, is Professor Murray Roberts. Uh, he's a uh, professor of applied marine biology and ecology at the University.
University of Edinburgh. He leads the Changing Ocean Research Group and coordinates the European Atlas and I Atlantic projects. He studies deep sea structural habitats, notably those formed by cold water corals, and his plans for their long term management and conservation. Since 1997, he worked on cold water, his work on cold water corals and deep sea biology has taken him to sites of the UK, Norway, Ireland, and Southeast United States and Cape Verde of West Africa. Among his external roles, he has a contributing, he was a contributing author to the 2014 and 2019 APCC reports and co-lead editor of the 2014 United Nations Conservation on Biological Diversity Report uh, on ocean acidification. He lead the first Insight Phase Data Initiative and was a partner in the Anchor Project examining ecological connectivity between North Sea platforms. He sits on the second Insight Phases Program Advisory Group and beginning in 2024, Professor Roberts will co-lead a deep sea ecosystem restoration work package as part of the European Redress Consortium. Welcome, Professor. Good morning, everybody. Um, I think the advice is to stay down here, which I'm happy to do. I'm a university lecturer, and I'm used to roaming around while I talk, but I'll try to be relatively static. Um, wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's always a great pleasure to be in Rio. Hugely fantastic to be here. I think it's my uh, fourth visit, and, and I look forward to coming back. Um, I'm actually going to, when my slides come up, give you an introduction to what I'll talk about today. I'll be talking about the INSIGHT program primarily, uh, but before I get into the details of what the INSIGHT program is, I'll tell you a little bit about where I come from and what some of my motivations are. Now, INSIGHT, some of you may have heard of, it's a program that's looking at the influence of man-made structures in the ecosystem of the North Sea. Uh, there have been two phases, as, as you heard in, that, uh, in those introductory remarks from Marcelo. We're now, We're now at the now end of that, end second, of that phase, second phase, or coming towards the end of the second phase, and there will be a third phase. Very keen to stay in touch uh, with everyone in Brazil as that phase moves forward. But before I get into those details, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about the University of Edinburgh, where I come from. Uh, the University of Edinburgh is Scotland's largest university. It's one of the oldest universities. It's also got a proud history of oceanographic research, the, I hope the oceanographers in the room, if there are any, know the name Charles Wyville Thompson, who led the Challenger expedition 150 years ago. He was a professor at the University of Edinburgh. Sadly, the work of the writing of the reports from that expedition led to his early death. There's a lesson there for all of us, I think. <laughs> Here's a, a couple of graphics just describing what the University of Edinburgh is. We're a big university in, the term, in terms of Scotland, not quite as big as the university that I'm, I'm in today, uh, but we were founded back in 1583. We're well ranked in the world, and we have a very broad uh, research portfolio. And I want to give you some examples of that in terms of the marine sciences. So we turned over about a billion in research over five years, roughly a billion pounds a year are turned over through the university. Around 40, it's more than this now, about 44,000 undergraduates. Uh, and we have many uh, uh, students from around the world. And the Edinburgh model is really to bring students to Scotland. That's always been our model, rather than building campuses all across the world. We like people to come to Scotland, be part of what was a, a nation that brought forward the Scottish Enlightenment and a sort of really interesting cluster of expertise and knowledge. Now, in terms of the marine sciences and ocean sciences, just to put my talk into some context, I won't go through each and every point on this graphic, but within Edinburgh University, we actually cover all of the issues surrounding oceans and sustainable human use of the oceans. That could be from an engineering perspective, ecological perspective, or a human and societal perspective. We also have a very large law school. Sadly, we recently lost Professor P uh, Alan Boyle, who was one of the leading academics, expert in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. But that law school and the expertise we have in policy and the human factor, I think, gives us a very interesting uh, insight into how we best manage the oceans moving forward at a time of rapid, and I think probably now uncontrollable climate change. 
So to now move to uh, the details of the talk that I want to give today, I want to talk about insight, and I want to use insight just as one example with a few other examples that I'm bringing in uh, around how this community, mostly in the UK, but across to the Netherlands and Germany and other parts of the insight family, have been addressing the challenge of what do these structures do in the ecosystem? That's our exam question. How do we understand that influence? How do we provide stakeholders with independent scientific and evidence-based advice to better understand the influence of the structures in the ecosystem? And there's a couple of very important words in there, independent and science and evidence, right? Those are the, those are the guiding principles of the INSIGHT program. So although the first phase of the INSIGHT program was established uh, fully with industry support, there's phase one from 2014 through till 2018, that was entirely industry funded. It was managed by an independent scientific oversight board that was responsible for determining the science areas that would be studied and it was responsible for giving out the projects and managing the projects. They reported back to the industry sponsors, absolutely, but the industry did not guide that process, did not control that process. That gave the Insight team um, great credibility. There's, there's always the issue with this kind of work that the perception, and it's sometimes an unfair perception, that if the money comes from X, then X is controlling the outputs. And we were very, very clear in Insight that that would not be the case. And that goes back now to 12, 13 years ago of working up that plan, how to run the program. The first phase, as you can see, it wasn't just a UK program by any means. We have University of Wageningen, we have Alfred Wegener Institute, so Netherlands and Germany, uh, and NEOS, the Royal Netherlands Institute for Sea Research, all partners in a North Sea program. The phase that we're now in uh, is a combination of government funding from the UK, the Natural Environment Research Council, our Centre for Ecosystems and Fisheries, Aquaculture Science, CFAS, again a government agency, coming together with industry to co-fund. So you see the Insight sponsors have put in £1.9 million and NERC around £5 million to make the second programme happen. And it's that I want to give you some results from today, just to give you a, a flavour of what Insight has done. But starting quickly with phase one, and don't worry, I'm not gonna give you outputs from each of these projects. I'm just gonna focus on a couple to give you a bit of an idea. You can see the sponsors that were behind that first phase research program. And most of this work really looked at data and it looked at projects that could be run in silico, modeling projects. We couldn't afford to go out to sea to do lots of process-based studies. We needed to work with existing data. That was the kind of guiding principle behind that first phase of the INSIGHT program. The Insight Data Initiative I led from the University of Edinburgh, we also led through Leanne Henry, Dr. Leanne Henry, an appraisal of network connectivity between oil and gas structures. Again, theoretical modeling of how the species that colonize the platforms are connected one to the other. Are they forming a network? Are they indeed supplying propagules, larvae to other places? How important is that? That was a kind of focus of the anchor project. This particular picture is from a workshop back in 2017, which actually was part of the data initiative and led to a very interesting output. One of the things I'm extremely keen on, and I think many of us in, in, you know, get this, is how do we best share the data, environmental data from industry, how do we bring that across and, and make that available and use it? Because if we don't maximize the use of the data we have, we're never gonna get to the solutions that we need. So this paper here came from that workshop and looks at, looks at the data challenges and opportunities for environmental management of North Sea oil and gas decommissioning in an era of blue growth. And therefore, that blue growth, how are things growing and changing in the future, if we get these decisions right now as we decommission, we'll be in far better place when offshore wind rolls out and upscales as it's going to. Now there are challenges, and I think we all know in this audience what they are. There's often commercial sensitivity. Why should we share the data? Are the data cleaned up and ready? Who's gonna pay for that to happen? How is it standardized? This is so critical, especially for biological data where protocols can change quite a lot, making it very hard to analyze trends. I'll give you some examples of that later in my talk. How do we manage expectations? We have to have clear and transparent communication and build trust. And fundamentally, that means getting to know each other across the sectors. So scientists and industry people form, you know, ideally project-based relationships. They're working together. They're sharing the challenges and opportunities of the issues that we're looking at. Uh, and at the end there, the point that if sampling methods do change over time, that really limits the future applicability of the data. For instance, looking at long-term ecological trends, if you change the protocols, you won't be able to do that. And I'll give you some examples of that particular point. 
So let's now think about the big challenges um, and considerations when we're thinking around decommissioning from the InSight perspective. There are by now many thousands of artificial structures in the sea. There are, of course, tens of thousands of shipwrecks in the sea. So we've had a major effect, but we don't really well understand what effect that has on the ecosystem. Many of these um, uh, structures are approaching end of life, and we need detailed plans to consider how they'll be decommissioned and to make, as we've heard this morning uh, and yesterday, how are we going to do that in the best environmental way? Are there opportunities for nature positive solutions, things that actually give nature a helping hand? And I want to give you some examples of some thinking around that too. The policy landscape that we work in is different in different parts of the world. So I'm from the Northeast Atlantic, so we work through um, the OSPAR uh, Commission's uh, regulations, so the clean seabed policy and the policy I think is largely taken in many parts of the world to consider how do we remove everything, that should be our baseline understanding, but sometimes is that the best decision? Do we actually cause more troubles by doing that? Do we inadvertently release more greenhouse gases by doing that than we would otherwise have done? I want to show you some information coming from Scottish research in that area too. So the policy landscape is complicated, and as we were hearing from Ting yesterday, it can vary and create churn and uncertainty. So that's a massive issue for the industry. It's also a big issue for all of us that work in this area. If things are continually changing, how, how are projects going to move forward in a consistent manner? How are we going to actually understand what we need to understand? So the creation of these multiple pressures as a result of structures needs to be understood, but also opportunities those structures provide, as rigs to reefs and other things, they need to be understood and brought into our decision making. And in the end, which environmental options uh, and societal outcomes are most appropriate. So the scale of the challenge is huge. Uh, this is a picture of the Northwest Hutton jacket um, back in July of 2009. I mean, these are, these are big engineering projects. I am amazed when I speak to engineers and I see the imagery that comes through from the North Sea, just showing how the ingenuity that's behind this is quite staggering. And something I talk a lot to my students about, and people get that, they understand that. So there's a lot that we're learning. Looking at the structures, as I've, I've done for a few years, back in 1999, I was offshore with Mobile, North Sea, looking at corals growing on the legs of the oil platforms. It was rather ironic at the time the companies were being sued for potential damage to those corals in the natural environment by drilling. Meanwhile, they were growing in abundance on their own platforms, but they never knew. The ROV pilots knew. When I looked at the videos, I knew. Companies had no idea. We need to get a lot better than that. You know, I think we are much better in the 20 years that have elapsed, but I still see lots of mismatches and lots of communication issues. And really, it shouldn't be as hard as it is. These pictures are showing um, the, um, this is from London, Britain, and it's the Heather platform, actually. Uh, some of the platforms, I'm not allowed to tell you where they come from, uh, but you can probably work it out when you look at the maps. The platforms are smothered in marine life. In the northern North Sea, we have an Atlantic water influence that sweeps in from the west of Shetlands. And that brings larvae, I think, from the Atlantic margins of these deep sea corals that form vast colonies. These pictures are from back in 19, uh, about 2007, 2008, these were taken. In the years since then, the colonies, of course, only have got bigger. And they are an opportunity that I'll talk about a bit later in my talk. There are a lot of platforms. So here's the, the key take home. We thought we had a lot of oil platforms, getting up to 563 fixed platforms currently. But as the wind farms move in, the numbers are forecast to go up to over 4,250 turbines and associated structures. So this is an industrialization of the shallow seas that we've never seen before, that's going to bring with it all kinds of change. You can't put that much hard substrate in without things changing. And these are the kinds of ecological questions that are right at the heart of the insight approach. There are other implications of this industrialization as well. These wind farms are going to be transmitting power, of course. Sometimes the power uh, cables will be trenched, they will be buried. What we don't understand well are what are the implications of the power transmission and the electromagnetic fields those cables create on marine species. So we've partnered with an independent research laboratory built by a philanthropist on the east coast of Scotland in a tiny fishing village called St. Abbs. It's one of the smallest marine stations in the world, but it's got a unique capability. 
the philanthropist who built it was concerned about that issue and took the decision to build it without any iron girders to hold up the roof or rebar in the floor. It's an entirely non-ferrous facility. So when we put Helmholtz coils in this facility and we simulate electromagnetic field exposures, we can actually do the experiments to see what those cables might do to marine species. Why is it important? Well, marine species navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. Some sense their prey, sharks and uh, rays sense their prey from the tiny signals given off from the muscles of their prey. If you put a huge cable generating an EMF exposure, an electromagnetic field next to those organisms, what's it going to do? There is real huge uncertainty around this. Some laboratory studies in St. Abs and a few other places are coming out. There are very few and there's hardly any data in the real world. That's what we need to see happen. So the local challenges are significant. Um, there's a picture there you won't know uh, necessarily the geography as well. This is the east coast of Scotland, and there's the Firth of Forth moving into where Edinburgh is. So this is the east coast of Scotland. We're going to be seeing £37 billion pounds worth of in inward investment to create those, wind, those wind, for, uh, wind farms. And the drive to net zero, I think, looks a lot like the drive for oil and gas in the 1970s that led to platforms being built without much consideration of decommissioning. And I think we're mo moving into that similar territory if we're not really careful. We've got to get the decisions right when we install. And if we can install the turbines, thinking about how they provide nature positive solutions for oyster reefs and other things, so much the better. But we must understand the implications of what we do. And one or two examples I added in just this morning to show you. We're working with the Dutch at the University of Wageningen to understand the implications on uh, electromagnetic fields on sharks and rays. So these are all Scottish cold water shark and ray species that we're able to keep in this very high quality aquarium. And in a, in a very simple study uh, that's now running, we built a 15 meter long tank. Effectively, the sharks and rays are put at one end, some bait is put at the other, and there's a Helmholtz coil here. You can see the coil running around the tank. It could be on or off and running at different levels, and we're monitoring the effects on the animals. And we're also taking bloods and looking at the effects on what it does to these organisms. This is great but we need this kind of work in the field. So any of you that are connected with offshore wind, very, very keen to talk to you about this kind of research, because if we can grow collaborations between Scotland and Brazil in this area, I think it would be fabulous. Going back to insight and the big picture stories of where our program is based, the North Sea has changed radically. Now, it, it's, it was fringed hundreds of years ago with oyster reefs. It's a very, very suitable habitat for deep-sea corals. You see them growing on the hard legs of the platforms. What we don't know is whether before the trawling industry moved into the northern North Sea, there were natural populations of deep-sea corals. There's a couple of old records in the literature, but they're not many. There are quite a few fisheries records, but the science around that is, is, is bad. We don't have the good information. The baseline has shifted, as it has for so many ecosystems around the world. So, we need to understand this, and at the end of the day, how should we integrate and embed decommissioning processes and support the transition to net zero carbon emissions? So that's kind of the, the big picture thinking that sits behind the INSIGHT program, and will be very, very prominent in the third phase of the INSIGHT program. So what I want to do now is just very quickly take you through some of the projects that are running, and I can't go through all of them, and I can't sadly give you lots and lots of detail because th there isn't an awful lot of time but it will give you a flavor of the diversity of the research and the way that this has worked. And this has worked by the program advisory group and myself, I, I wrote the science case for this. Dick and Hal at Hal Marine Consulting wrote the policy and impact case. And we then put out a call for proposals to the academic community. You never quite know what then comes back, do you? This, what you'll see are the successful proposals that came back, that went through peer review, that were then funded as a result of the call for proposals. And here they are. There's a very, very interesting one at the bottom that I don't have any results for you yet because it's only just come in through our industry fund. But Richard Thompson is, I think, one of the leading, if not the leading academics in microplastics and marine plastics research. I and mean, he was doing this before it was an issue. And some of his, I mean, th to be honest, his influence on things like BBC's Blue Planet documentary brought that issue to global attention and actually changed the world. Everyone now knows about marine plastics. But before Richard Thompson got involved, they really, they really didn't. So you can run your eyes down the variety of projects that we have running in the Insight program. Some are very technical uh, and engineering in their focus. Some are very environmental, uh, very biological in their focus. And I, the best ones, I think, integrate uh, across those domains. 
I'll start with benthic growth estimates on man-made structures using no novel imaging techniques. Um, and this is run by Tom Wilding and colleagues at the Scottish Association for Marine Science, which is a gorgeous laboratory. If you're ever in Scotland, you must visit SAMS. It sits, as you can see, in one of the most stunning places. And what Tom and his colleagues have been doing is taking ROV footage, industry footage, uh, when they can get it, and then working out um, automated routines to classify that footage and build three-dimensional models. So moving from very static and processes that rely on human intervention to automated processes. So you can see you some of the results the there, clustering the uh, anemones and other soft corals that grow on that structure. And if this, I hope, works as well, you can see how with a natural rocky reef, we can now start to produce very beautiful um, three-dimensional reconstructions of the habitats, as we can of the platforms. And then using AI and uh, deep learning approaches to classify the different organisms, we can pull out the sponges from the soft corals, from the hard corals, as you can see with these different shades that Tom and his team have put onto that video. So there's a lot of development in how we assess and understand the marine life that grows on these structures. And we're getting, I think, a lot better at then understanding how those organisms connect and form ecologically important networks. This is work that's being led from uh, Harriet Watt University. It's called the Kazans Project, and it's looking at hard substrate assemblages across the North Sea. And you can see straight away there are an awful lot of logos. A lot of people are behind each of these projects, and there's a lot of interdisciplinary expertise needed to run these studies. So this particular uh, pro, uh, pro, uh, research project has run through its review, its uh, selected sites, it shortlisted the species that you can see on, on the slide here, and it's now running through the process of it making uh, simulated models to look at how those species might disperse. Work that we've done with deep sea corals ourselves over several years, and this project is following up with a few other species. But they're also putting in settlement plates to then see, can we calibrate that? Can we actually see evidence for those species colonizing where we think they're going to be colonizing? And this can help in the future as we think about where sites could be priorities for ecosystem restoration. And that's a, a theme I want to pick up again with you uh, at the end of my talk. Now, if we understand how we monitor and survey these organisms and these structures, and we understand something of their connectivity, we also need to understand their functioning, right? This is often very absent. We, we kind of see it there, we know it's there, but is it important? How is it working? Is it somehow altering the food chain? Is it fundamental in ecosystem function? Uh, the project that's um, run by the University of Essex called FUCOMS is looking at the functionality uh, and ecological connectivity of man-made structures. This project still has quite a lot of work to finish up, but they've got some initial conclusions coming out of their studies. So it's a simplified uh, food web of the North Sea. So you can see the predators at the top of the food web, the different trophic levels running through to even bacteria and microalgae. Um, the results are showing what we know already from the northern North Sea. So the contaminants associated with cutting piles alter the ecology. Now that's clear. There's lower diversity within 500 meters of man-made structures, but larger invertebrates seem more susceptible to impacts and although there are fewer interactions, there's a more connected food web within 500 meters. So we're now starting to layer ecological functioning onto what was otherwise quite a static picture of the diversity in and around these structures. And just to pull back to some of that early work and to flag up something that I think is really significant and worth noting, back in the 1980s, the UK industry, through Oil and Gas UK as was, it's now Offshore Energies UK, agreed to centralize data from the cruciform surveys that run around the platforms, the routine monitoring of the macrobenthos, the, the worms and the, the little shells and things that live within the sediments. Those data were centralized in a database. It cost almost nothing for that to happen for the companies, but they created a long-term repository, the UK Benthos database managed by Paul Kingston at Heriot Watt University. We got a contract to reanalyze that and to look for long-term ecological trends. We did it 10 years ago, but the database runs from 1977, and we looked at it up until 2012 in 700 surveys. The exam question we were given from Oil and Gas UK was, was there a far field effect of contamination? When you go out a kilometer from the platforms, were the communities altered by contamination, or was something else at play? So effects of cutting piles uh, were important, but we had the idea and absolutely built into our statistics the effects of changing oceans, 
the North Sea Basin, like every other basin on the planet, is warming and changing. The food regime is changing, and it's actually changing really probably faster than we thought it was. So we looked at these, but there's a few important take-homes from this. The first goes back to that point that came from our Insight Data Initiative. Maybe don't change the protocols unless there's a really, really, really good reason to do so. Because to do really rigorous ecological statistics as we needed to do, we could have looked at 237 sites in that database. We could only look at 19 that were, hadn't really, that were robust, statistically robust to make the comparisons. But on the basis of that, we were able to show a few interesting trends. The first one, before I go into this one, the first one that in the far field, the feature that drove change in the ecology wasn't contamination, it was warming of the basin. It was oceanographic regime change that was driving change in the ecology. So if you don't monitor that change and understand that change in all of the environmental assessments and put it in a regional context, you may be inadvertently ascribing a direct human pressure to causing a change when actually a global climatic driver probably warming is causing that change to happen. But we've worked a lot in recent years as, as ecologists to produce much more rigorous statistics, sometimes taking very diverse data sets into, into that kind of approach. The other thing that came out in some of the surveys were in, on these plots, what you can take away is when things are lining up as they are here, there's a kind of recovery from a, a, a disturbed situation. Things are lining and recovering. Um, but we, in some of the surveys, found that, that things went back the other way. They went back to a scattered distribution. What we think has happened here is that where things were recovering and restabilizing, suction dredging caused a reset in the recovery trajectory. Again, something that's often decommissioning well, needs to take into account, needs to understand that we may introduce more problems in an otherwise all, almost recovered um, ecology. And this is all written up in a paper here uh, uh, that, that, that you can access on the historic scale and persistence of cuttings impacts uh, to the North Sea benthos. Benthos is you know, animals that live on the seabed. Um, and I just wanted to flag that really critical value, that decision in the 1980s to centralize the data and then keep it going. So important. But unless someone you know, takes that idea forward, a team of people take that idea forward and keep it running, it's the kind of thing that easily falls by the way and isn't supported in the long term. So having talked about um, invertebrates and talked about the animals that live in the sediment to some extent, the other things I think we often, we often observe ourselves when we see videos from oil platforms is just how many fish shoal and aggregate around these structures. So it was great to see uh, scientists in Scotland come up with a program of research to look at the aggregation of fish around the structures. This is led by Paul Fernandez. He used to be in Aberdeen, he's now at Harriet Watt University. And he's running this project, Fish Density Around Man-Made Structures, Fish Pams. And he's taking a very innovative approach. And I've got a short video that I'll let play here. And in fact, Paul's put some captions on this. This is an autonomous surface vehicle. Who is on board, it, it says? No one. And there's the clever bit, right? So a fully autonomous surface vehicle. And here it is out doing its work. And one of the neat things here is that this vehicle will be able to get, as it says here, much closer into platforms, much closer into standoff zones and so forth than other vehicles would be. It's got a fish finding sonar on board. It was the first time this vehicle, I think, had deployed such a sonar. And the data, the, this work is ongoing. So these data are not fully available yet. We've just got the video for you today to give you a sense of how, of how this work is going. And I'll show you another example of autonomous robotics use in the Insight program shortly. So it gives you an idea. Some of the results that are coming from Paul's work, though, um, oil and gas platforms have larger near-field areas of influence on fish uh, density. Uh, larger structures have larger uh, spheres of influence. But it's variable across space and time. And new technologies like this allow for low risk and low cost and low carbon assessments of fish um, around these man-made structures. That low carbon point's interesting. We're having a very, very active debate in the UK about low carbon research vessels. You know, it's, uh, it's a very challenging situation for a natural environment research council to run the most carbon intensive infrastructure in the country. So there's a lot of work looking at low, de trying to decarbonize research vessel infrastructure in the UK at the moment. Some initial results from this work, uh, looking at the fish that sh uh, are strolling around offshore uh, wind turbines 
you tend to see quite a dramatic increase in the density within the structures. So again, this is from acoustic monitoring, passive acoustic monitoring, showing the density increases, sometimes a five times increase in the shoals within the structures. I mean, it's hard numbers on what we've seen anecdotally in the videos and we've tried to score. I've had many students over the years do this kind of work. I always like to put student results in a presentation. So this is from a guy called Rakeem Lashley, who uh, joined me from the Caribbean to work on fish that associate with oil, oil platforms. He found no significant differences between two of the major platforms he looked at. The poor guy looked at thousands and thousands of hours of ROV video to do this work. So credit to Rakeem for doing that. But what he did find when you look up and down the platform legs, you're going from one meter depth to 30 meters depth and then so forth down the platform, you can see the communities of fish do change quite radically. Now this isn't, of course, data the oil company went out and surveyed for us. That's us using ancillary data. It's extra value from this vast archive of information. Uh, I'm lucky in a university to have smart, talented, motivated students who are prepared to do this kind of work. And with the basic negotiations and that, uh, that sort of mindset change to share the data, we can start to extract really nice ecological information from existing uh, industry video. And, we, and it's incredibly cheap to do, it, to do this work. So we do see uh, a very abundant and interesting fish population that's actually got a lot of similarities to natural reef occurrences. So just as we've seen from Gulf of Mexico, over in Thailand, we see the same in the North Sea. These places do function as artificial reefs. Uh, and it would be nice to get more information on that. Uh, a student working alongside Rakeem, uh, called Emily Murphy Gray, uh, was asking the question, well, how similar are the invertebrate communities between platforms and natural cold water coral reefs? So you can see on the map here, we've been able to look at the platform in the uh, northern North Sea and compare with some of the nearby natural deep sea coral reefs, the Tisla and Sakhon reefs in Norway and Sweden. Uh, we found a lot of species that are found in both the platform and the reef, uh, and we uh, ran some statistics to make comparisons. Here's one of the headlines, uh, more pictures of corals growing on oil platforms. The scale doesn't necessarily come across, but this red fish here, do you see that tiny little thing I'm pointing at? That fish might be about 30 centimeters long. So these coral colonies are meters and meters across by now. In terms of the stories that come from these uh, uh, analyses, the oil platform had slightly higher, not significantly higher, but very similar hard coral cover to the natural reef. The Shannon diversity index of the invertebrates that we looked at was variable, but broadly similar to the natural reef. Of course, there'll be differences. We don't have all of the microbiome necessarily, all of the small organisms in the sediment pockets in a natural reef on an oil platform, but for the major epifauna, the things that live on the structure, it's, it's actually rather similar. So I've now kind of got to the point where I'll start to come up in the scales and talk about the bigger animals, how do bigger organisms associate with these man-made structures. Uh, very nice work here from uh, University of St. Andrews and the Sea Mammal Research Unit. Uh, I don't have a lot of information from Debbie's project, because again, she's very active, but she's produced a kind of cartoon of the, of the trends in her results that are coming through. And she's been thinking a lot about whether or not the piling associated with wind turbine installations will have a significant effect on seals that feed and forage across the North Sea. She's also got wonderful information on how seals track along oil pipelines feeding on the fish that aggregate on the pipelines. I mean, the seals aren't stupid. They go where the food is, and they're following infrastructure, just as the fishermen themselves, the trawling, trawling industry in the North Sea follows the pipelines, has done so for many years. So the take home here, pre-construction, happy seals feeding all across the site. During piling, the seals disappear, somewhat unsurprisingly. But during construction, she's not finding very significant changes. Uh, Well-managed construction, the marine mammals seem to be in, in, the, in the area quite well and during the operation, uh, similar story. And this is important because we have globally significant populations of these marine mammals, both the seals and the harbor porpoises, in the areas that are slated for uh, huge upscaling of offshore wind development. So this is all work based on animal tracking, sensors applied, as you can see in these pictures, just about as a sensor on the seal's head, developed and engineered in Scotland. If people are interested in that, Debbie Russell and the Sea Mammal Research Unit are an excellent uh, group to speak with. Um, Actually, one point that, that's re related to this, we think a lot about um, autonomous underwater vehicles. We think a lot about the technology. I love it uh, when it works. 
these organisms, when outfitted with these sensors, become roving uh, natural robots collecting all kinds of environmental data. So it's not just that you're getting information on where the animal's been, it's giving you information on the characteristics of the water. So this is a, a really interesting uh, integration of ecology, physics, and uh, technology. Now, an example from Insight in terms of autonomous um, techniques for infrastructure ecological assessment. This is the Dan Jones's project, the At Sea project. He's using one of the UK fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles that we hold in the uh, academic community. Uh, so these are auto sub vehicles. Um, there was one, you may have heard this funny story, uh, a UK research vessel was to be named and a poll went out to the British public and the name that the British public said for the new vessel was to be Boaty McBoatface. You may have heard this story. In the end, it didn't get named Boaty McBoatface. It was named the Sir David Attenborough, and the Sir David Attenborough is now a global class research ship for the British Antarctic Survey primarily. But what we did do was take that name and one of these autonomous underwater vehicles is now called Boaty McBoatface. By the way, everyone at British Antarctic Survey still refers to the big ship as Boaty. That's it. <laughs> So it's kind of nice. I think that, that side of the British personality is, is kind of nice. So what has this survey done? What has the At Sea survey done? A hugely ambitious project, but it worked. They did, they did brilliantly. They did a shore launch from Shetland. So here are the, there's Scotland, right? There's a very northern tip of Scotland. There are the Orkney Islands, and here are the Shetland Islands. By the time you get up to Shetland, you feel like you're in Norway. The culture's different. It's a wonderful place. So the, the AUV was launched from uh, Shetland, and then it made a 750, 20-day, fully autonomous mission out to uh, the two fields, Don and to Northwest Hutton, visiting the now cut-off uh, remaining lower legs of the jacket at Northwest Hutton, and then on to the Braemar Pockmark Special Area of Conservation, 120 meters water depth, an area with known persistent hydrocarbon seepage, natural seepage, it's a pockmark field, um, as an analog for a decommissioning leakage scenario. So these results are all being written up at the moment, and we're very happy and insight to connect you with any of the investigators if you want to follow up on any of the science uh, that I'm summarizing here today. That's a very, very interesting kind of glimpse into the future of the capability of these vehicles. This one, a very close collaboration between the NOC and BP. Uh, an earlier version of that vehicle, the Autosub 6000, so that was not a full ocean depth vehicle, this is a full ocean depth vehicle. We've been working on, in a project I've coordinated called iAtlantic, to enhance the biological relevance um, of this system. So. Uh, in, I think industry now, you, you know, everyone's very familiar with what AUVs can do in terms of multi-beam bathymetric survey, image survey, uh, and so forth. But now we want to push that towards real biological sampling. So we need to gather samples subsea and do it autonomously. This robotic cartridge sampling instrument called Roxy has now achieved that, and we took it through technology readiness five to seven in the Atlantic project by taking it from the situation where it would work in a pressure chamber, in a laboratory, at depth, simulated depth, it's actually working in the field. It took two missions to do that, it wasn't simple, but it actually wasn't the problem with the Roxy instrument, it was technical challenges with the auto sub vehicle, but we, we overcame those and we used a newer vehicle. The Roxy was so impressive, it's now been taken over and acquired by McLean Research Labs, and I was checking their website earlier this week, you can see it there already. So if people in industry are interested in gathering environmental DNA samples, this is a way you can now do this autonomously, and we're very happy to help connect you through our Atlantic um, and our innovation and exploitation uh, manager, who's, who's a guy called Andrew Carey. The other thing that Insight has done and is active in at the moment is pulling back from the detail of the projects and just thinking about what's the consensus of opinion around decommissioning? And is there a consensus of opinion in, in, you know, in the scientific community? Uh, a couple of examples of this, the DREAMS project, looking at the relative effects of alternative management systems, has conducted a very significant literature review that's now uh, published in um, environmental evidence. So over 20,000 records retrieved, nearly 1,000 articles retained, um, and the information from this is all fully available. And when we look at it in, in, in more detail, it just gives a very nice global picture of where man-made structures are, be they artificial reefs, offshore wind farms, oil and gas structures, and even shipwreck information is included here. Now, the databases aren't always perfect. We don't always have the information, but we're starting to get far better at pulling this in. This is work that's currently in review at Nature Sustainability. 
So is there a consensus view among scientists about what effects structures have and what we do with structures at the end of their lives? So this now moves into that more sort of social science phase of the insight program where we simply get together with people, we workshop and we talk. In this case, Anthony Knights has led a, a piece of work with 40 scientists across three workshops to think, try and ascertain what scientists' views are. But also, and I think this is a really interesting bit, to think about how variable those views are. You know, is there sort of conflict in this or is there consensus? So there are both negative and positive um, aspects of decommissioning scenarios for the environment and society, and this is coming through clearly. But it seems, uh, you know, therefore, there are challenges for both the policy and decision-making worlds. But we need to work this through. There's a consensus that more if, uh, evidence is needed before any decommissioning policy is changed. And that decisions are needed on a case-by-case -case basis, accounting for trade-offs and the costs and benefits at the local level. And we heard great things on the panel yesterday about how we make those decisions in you know, a comparative assessment framework. We also heard about how overly complex those frameworks can be and how hard it can be to get the, that information across. But overall, at the end, repurposed or abandoned structures or multiple structures contribute most strongly to the majority of environmental targets and aspirations identified. Uh, in programs put forward by the UN and indeed by OSPAR. And scientists are kind of rallying around that. There's a consensus that's building that full removal might not always be the most sensible decision at the end of the day. Everything needs to be looked at, everything needs to be understood, and scientists will always uh, say that um, more evidence is needed. But I think more and more people are starting to come to the view that we do have evidence and insights done a lot of work in that area, as has the great work in Australia and elsewhere in the world, in the Gulf of Mexico, that there can be um, a new thinking might be needed. So to start moving towards the end of the talk, I want to talk about how insight has um, taken its message out there. So a critical thing here is to Note that Insight very much takes this view, right, as articulated by a former chief scientist of the UK government, uh, Lord May, Robert May. The role of the scientist is not to decide between the possibilities, but to determine what the possibilities are. That's a fundamental thing that all the teams in Insight absolutely sign up to. But scientists do have opinions, they do have views, and I think we need to workshop that and just explore that and take some profit from that information. So in terms of the impact strategy, uh, I think some uh, very nice developments. There's an annual science conference, social media, outreach, webinars, and I've got a few quick examples of that. So there's conferences running in the UK, lots of social media and project comms that you're welcome to, to come into. You can see there's that famous boat team at boat face. That's how uh, offshore energy picked up the, um, uh, the at sea project. And there's webinars. Webinars have been running uh, throughout the research program, and there's a couple still to come. So if you're interested and you have students or others uh, in your companies that might be interested, uh, you're very, very welcome to join in to these last two webinars. Just for our friends at the back of the room, I think my presentation is, uh, we're back again, it's working again. So you're welcome to join, and there's the impact page uh, on the Insight North Sea website if you want to follow that. Now, in terms of next steps, I want to run through how Insight's moving forward into its final phase and then give a few personal reflections on nature positive and restoration solutions which can benefit alongside rollout decommissioning. Here are the three phases once again, our first phase, the industry funded phase, the phase that we're now in that's moving towards its conclusion. The third phase, starting summer 2024, is going to have a more policy and social science focus than the previous two phases. So we ran through largely modeling studies, work in the computer, work in, you know, at the desk, through to field studies that you've seen summarized today, through to now the human side of the scenario becoming more important. So we need to look at European related policy impacts, the environmental effects of decommissioning, environmental and other value of structures, so how do we economically value the structures, taking into account roles they have in the ecosystem? Natural capital accounting approaches would be relevant here. How do we look towards nature positive decommissioning? How do we um, innovate new research collaborations and policy engagement? So that's where we're seeing the focus in Insight now moving. And then I throw this slide in, which I did actually as I came across on the plane. Because this paper, I think, is a really important paper it's not my area of expertise. I said this on the panel yesterday, but I would really like people to start reading this and thinking about this paper. 
And I want to give credit to Abigail Davis and the team behind this. Abigail did this as part of her PhD. She's, uh, she was a PhD student at the start time at the University of Aberdeen, just appointed a lecturer at Robert Gordon's university. And uh, Abby and her team have had the, the kind of the passion and the drive to try to compile the evidence around greenhouse gas emissions from decommissioning and to project that f into the future, noting how much more uh, will need to be decommissioned as offshore wind turbines reach the end of their lives. And the statistics are really stark. Greenhouse gas emissions from decommissioning are underreported, not by a little bit, but by a half. The offshore oil and gas decommissioning has produced 25 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is about half a percent of annual greenhouse gas emissions. This future decommissioning of offshore wind could mean that those emissions increase 200 times by 2067. But Abby and her team are balanced, and they note that data sources on the greenhouse gas inventory related to decommissioning are sometimes very sparse and lacking. So there's uncertainty. But these are very stark results. And I'd really like to think about that. As I say, this is not my area of science. So I'm reading this and thinking, you know, is this right? Can we criticize this? How can we understand this? But these are big uncertainties and big issues. And when we're thinking about the right strategies, we've got to think about the greenhouse gas emissions related to the activity. We, we have to. Everything that's changing in the world is changing as a result of our release of carbon dioxide since the Industrial Revolution. And we need to bear that very, very strongly in mind. So I wanted to put that particular uh, slide up. This is not insight research, but it's extremely relevant um, additional research. The other uh, issue I wanted to give you a, an insight into is how I think we can use the corals that grow on oil platforms as a way to restore damage uh, in, the, in the natural environment. And I'm going back to somebody I mentioned at the start of my talk, Charles Wyville Thompson. He's that poor Edinburgh professor who was broken by the workload of writing up his Challenger expedition back in the 1800s. But he changed the world through the Challenger expedition and before he led that expedition, he was a scientist working west of Shetland, off the Faroes and Iceland, looking at whether or not there was life in those uh, deep areas of the continental shelf. And he was dredging. He was one of the pioneers of scientific dredging. He brought up uh, what he referred to as stony copses of coral covering many miles. He illustrated that in his book, The Depths of the Sea. Um, these areas I visited myself in 1997 on one of my first offshore expeditions. All I dredged up was dead coral and rubble. There's nothing living there anymore, but the area had been trawled heavily for 40 years. So what I'm arguing in the UK, and now with some success, is that we should take some of the corals that grow in abundance on North Sea oil platforms east of Shetland, just let's move them back and reseed them. Let's restore nature, not passively, not by just putting in a structure and leaving it be, but actively restoring, giving nature that helping hand. Uh, and that idea is starting to get real traction. Um, over in the UK and in Scotland. There's a natural reef. There's the artificial reef structure of the platform. That's what we do with that artificial structure currently. You know, we lift it, and the best idea, and I've checked this with everyone I can talk to about it, the best idea with the corals that are on the platform, which are now a waste management issue, they're a problem, uh, is to compost them. That's the very best idea. It's just not a good enough idea. There's 50 years of growth there. I'm arguing that we wouldn't rebuild a reef but we would reseed a, a network and then let healthy, happy corals spawn, develop, and reseed other areas over time. So we've been working on that over the last what, 10 years, really, and kind of in the spare time. This is work from the Anchor Project in the first phase of Insight, where Leanne Henry and her, her co-authors looked at how corals spawn from platforms. We know they live there. We know a lot of the biology of the larvae, thanks to great work in Sweden in, in particular. The, these are very far-spreading species. These, this is the same species that forms the big coral mounds in Campos Santos basins, Lophelia petusa or Desmophyllum petusum, depending on who you talk to. It's a really significant ecosystem engineer. It builds habitat. Not only does it form a network across the platforms, it also seeds larvae into marine protected areas uh, in Scandinavia. So if we remove the structures, you know, have we lost a stepping stone to those uh, natural populations? Would it be legitimate to take corals from here and put them here? We need to look at the genetics to understand this. Remember, this is not an invasive. This is a natural coral. But we still need to understand whether we're mixing populations. 
I think it's highly unlikely because the larvae spread so very far and the population genetics we've done so far show it's a really well mixed population in the North Atlantic. Not all deep sea corals are like that. But we need to understand if we restore an area, how resilient is it to climate change? And that's what I want to show you in just a few slides and I'll do this quite quickly. These slides are gonna show you a series of sites where we model the temperature, the saturation state of calcium carbonate. Corals build their skeletons from aragonite, these species. That's a mineral form of calcium carbonate that's quite vulnerable to ocean acidification. We'll look at salinity, pH, and we'll also look at particular organic carbon. Think food, how much food is getting down to the seabed? You won't have happy corals unless you've got plenty of food coming down and feeding them. And we're going to look at a, a few sites. First one, the Logachev Mounds. The Logachev Mounds, one of the most stunning natural deep sea coral reefs on the planet. These reefs are up to 200 meters high. They've grown over the last two million years. In the interglacial periods they grow, in the glacials they go back, they die, but then they come back again. They're very, very significant. But the projections that we see from Yuri Atoli's um, European Regional Seas ecosystem model are very stark. Number one, this is, this, these are good conditions for coral skeletons to be. It's blue, it means it's super saturated with respect to calcium carbonate. When it goes red, I'm sorry for the scale here, this is uh, present day, this is end of 21st century. When it goes red, it means it's corrosive to coral skeletons. And you can see there's a, that gradually gets shallower and shallower. So even up at the surface, we've got corrosive water. Now this carbon is in the Earth system, so this is gonna happen. There's no way this isn't gonna happen. So we'd better be ready and adapting as best we can. The other thing that's incredibly clear is that the food flux to the seabed, here's now lots of food coming down to the seabed at various times of the year, think spring bloom. Late in the century, hardly any food. The whole trophic system is changing. So this area we're all thinking now becomes incredibly unsuitable. It used to be very suitable. This comes out in habitat suitability modeling. When we look at shallower sites, now west of Shetland, you can see it's, it's, it's slightly less corrosive for longer. All right? So there's also a little bit more food fluxing down to the seabed. So these areas might be slightly better refuges. The oil platform itself if that was to remain there, those footings, like the Northwest Hutton footings were left there and there were some corals growing, do you know they're probably a refuge? And why are they particularly good? Because there is lots of food. So the shallower sites, I think we now need to start thinking about, looking after where we have existing structures potentially and looking to actively restore where we've lost them. And this starts to align ideas. Like I like to think about how things align in the policy space and the international space. This is a workshop that came from the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services and the UN uh, Framework on Climate Change. Now it's co-sponsored, but not officially endorsed by either, and it comes to the point that I've always felt, and lots of scientists feel, that it's extremely ironic that we work our climate and our biodiversity uh, negotiations separately. I mean, that makes no sense, right? They're intimately connected and need to be considered together. This scientific consensus says that. So good job, Hans Otto Porner and everyone. Connecting the climate and biodiversity spheres is especially crucial at this moment when the world seems to be gearing for stronger actions on both. So we've got great consistency between the ideas of restoring deep sea ecosystems in climate refugia and the concepts that are coming out of this co-sponsored workshop. We also, in the Northeast Atlantic contact, see great consistency with the vision of OSPAR, the OSPAR Commission in 2021 through the Kashkais Declaration. Sets out a number of very interesting um, concepts, including the OSPAR and the, and the uh, contracting parties will lead by example, intensifying efforts to protect, restore, and conserve the Northeast Atlantic. That's there, that word restore is there. So OSPAR, to be fair to the Secretariat, have taken the idea of taking corals from oil platforms in a restoration concept absolutely seriously. We've had meetings, given presentations, this idea is starting to gain some traction. So I hope we can move it forward and we have an opportunity to do so through um, the Redress Consortium. This is a new program of research, I'm not leading it, but Roberto Danavaro in Italy is leading this uh, overall. And Redress will conduct restoration actions at many sites uh, in the deep sea. It'll, we'll be working through uh, habitat refugia, thinking about that uh, climate refugia, working out the protocols to monitor and understand these places. And what I want to show you quickly is the sites that we'll be using, and you can see that famous picture of the corals on the platforms. So we now have a way to do the science, but this will be small scale. If I go back, I'll show you the budget. 
I think I've got a lot of industry people here. You might be quite amused at our budgets. You know, 10 million for four years of hard graft across about 30 different partners with the ambition of restoring ecosystems in all these places. If I think how much one of your vessel costs for a few days, we need to work together. We can afford to do the science and provide robust plans, but we cannot upscale. And I'm so interested, for instance, in could we develop something, maybe something that could be based on a torpedo mooring pioneered here in Brazil that would allow us to plant corals. Is that, for, is that possible? Shell are very interested in this. There's a decommissioning engineer, Frank Langer, who's very interested in that concept. He thinks it's possible. And if Frank thinks it's possible, I'm very happy to work with Frank or anyone else to see if we could do something together. We can pay for the science and a, t and a small team to come together around it, but we can't buy the torpedo moorings, we can't put them in the sea, nor can Scottish government. But if we work with industry, maybe we can do that. So this work is moving forward now. We launch in February, and I'm delighted to talk to people about that. So some concluding thoughts. Um, the consensus is building across science that complete removal is not always the preferable option, noting in many cases we do still need some more evidence and understanding. Programs like Insight have come a long way uh, and have been, a, I think, a really good mechanism uh, to pr pr produce that evidence. There's now a shift towards policy that's going to very much focus on nature positive decommissioning. We keep hearing that word. Uh, it's, be, it's been very strong while I've been in Brazil. That, that message has come across really clearly here. But the scale of the challenges means we can't do it alone. Industry can't work alone. Governments can't do this on their own. Academics certainly can't do this on their own. So it's this clever coming together in a proper, mutually respectable, respecting team, right? And that we can do. That we can do. It just takes some effort and some planning. Perhaps in the North Sea, it would be interesting to consider if policies were to change at some point and there were cost savings in decommissioning, that those cost savings were used to create an environment fund. That environment fund maybe could look at upscaling restoration ecology. Maybe it could look at new technologies and monitoring of marine protected areas, which none of our societies can afford. We often put marine protected areas in place in the deep ocean and nobody monitors them. What's the point? You don't know if your policy is working because you're not monitoring it. So some clever thinking there I think would be very interesting. I think we can restore an existing and future offshore energy industry footprint. So I'm talking with BP at the moment about whether we could restore within areas of Foynaven, Shahalian, for instance, with BP maybe taking some monitoring responsibility as part of existing surveys. And that's the clever thing. It's finding out how we align our operations uh, to do these things. And those are areas that are fully protected. They cannot be trawled. So they, they're restoration safe. Meantime, Scottish government is working to try to bring forward highly protected, marine protected areas. Because in Scotland, you may be surprised to hear if something's called a marine protected area, it doesn't control many activities necessarily, and bottom trawling is often permitted inside a marine protected area. We now want to see a move to more highly protected areas, but there's been a lot of political pushback and societal pushback because the consultations, I would argue, haven't been uh, well developed. So finally, build the industry, government, and academic uh, restoration and protected area monitoring strategies, which is something we're now actively doing through the European Redress Consortium. And it's wonderful to think we're doing this at the time of a decade of ecosystem restoration and through what's now a decade of ocean science for sustainable development. So all of these ideas are aligning in a way I've not seen uh, previously in my career. So I want to thank everyone who sent through slides and information for this talk. There's a lot of people. Uh, particular thanks actually to Hank Van Ryn at Hal Marine Consulting for all the work he's done in the background and uh, to you for listening today. Thank you very much.